Good evening. Uh, I'm Brian Butler from the Philosophy Department. Uh, happy to welcome you to the seventh annual uh, Door Lecture on Art and Aesthetics. This is the seventh annual Door Lecture. Joyce and Larry Door envisioned a, an annual lecture that would help bring a deeper understanding of the creative process to the UNC Asheville campus. With this in mind, they created an endowment uh, that the campus uses to bring a distinguished speaker on the nature of the creative process and the meaning of art in the contemporary world. While the endowment is the central catalyst for this event, this year's lecture would not have been possible without a further generous gift from Jim Topp and Paula Griot. I would also like to thank the generosity of other Asheville and on-campus organizations. These include the Media Arts Project, the Haywood Park Hotel, UNCA's Cultural and Special Events, Multicultural Affairs, University Programs, Humanities, the Multimedia Arts Council, and the Departments of Multimedia Arts and Sciences, Philosophy, Music, and Arts and Ideas. This is truly a city and campus-wide event. This year, we are honored to have as our door lecturer a world-renowned composer, writer, conceptual artist, and theorist. Paul Miller, also known as DJ Spooky, that subliminal kid. I see him as a particularly appropriate lecturer for the area. His work clearly relates to such honored locals as Charles Olson, Robert Moog, John Cage, and Robert Rauschenberg. Further, the Emersonian tones found in his work exemplified, exemplify a profound picture of the creative process, one with wide-ranging implications in such areas as originality, identity, and copyright law. Without further ado, Paul Miller. Hey, what's up, everybody? How you doing? Hello, hello. Um, First and foremost, I just want to say um, thanks to the philosophy department for bringing me. And, um, you know, I had no idea so many people were into philosophy. Eh? Um, but you guys, it's a beautiful day. And I just want to say thanks for coming out. I know everybody's got their hectic schedules. And you guys are all very busy with school and everything. And I'm chilling out. So, um, you know, I just wanted to like, say thank you. So um, tonight, I'm going to do a little bit of a uh, kind of a riff on my book, Rhythm Science, that came out on MIT Press a little while ago. And the book is basically kind of exploring how this hip hop, techno, drum and bass generation, all these styles of electronic music uh, have become part of the basic vocabulary of how we think about information. And that's a key word for me. Um, as an artist, writer, and musician, I like to think of music not as music, but as information. It's not really about just press and play and just everybody you know, has a good time, although that is, of course, why we DJ. But at the same time, you have to imagine that people have grown up, you know, I was born in the, the late, uh, you know, ancient 70s, you know, uh, the late 20th century, you know, and I grew up with uh, satellites. And you guys, uh, when I was on campus in the ancient early 90s, mid 90s you know uh, we barely had wireless networks and now of course all of that has come home to roost as the basic you know just you just turn on your computer and you kind of expect it like you expect good coffee you know um, so what I'm going to do tonight is unpack some of the issues from my book and the idea here is that we're looking at how do you make art out of patterns of culture and that's not necessarily about painting or sculpture or if, even for that matter a philosophy of rhythm because hip-hop and drum and bass, techno, ambient, all these styles are merely surface reflections of what I like to think of as a deeper phenomenon of urban youth culture's relationship to digital culture. So what I'm going to do is kind of unpack that. The book's called Rhythm Science and I'm going to kind of walk you guys through some of the issues that inspire me. So, with that said and done, behind me you have um, one of my favorite films. It's called Style Wars. And these are tags that were put on the trains in New York in the late 70s. And you can see everybody had a specific vocabulary. They were able to, you know, what they call bomb the system. Very quickly, you had to be able to get your tag up on the train, get your style out. And the goal of these kids, these were young kids, you know, 15, 13, 17. Um, the goal was to become what they call all city. And what was so beautiful about the graffiti movement, aside from Mayor Codd sicking dogs on kids and 
police chasing everybody down the railroad tracks to get away from it all, there's a strange uh, kind of quality because the city spent over, you know, something like $100 million plus to get kids to not put their identity on the trains. So what you're seeing here is a battle. This, these train logos are a battle between public space and private expression. Each of those kids worked for days, sometimes weeks, sometimes months to get that tag ready, you know, so they would be able to get it up on the train really quick and get out before the police or the dogs or whoever attacked them. So you have to imagine that these are meant to be something that's done quickly and elegantly and then they're out. So that these kind of tags are such a kind of a testimony of people's passion for expression. So the graffiti movement is what Karis one likes to call, you know, some of the elements of hip hop. But I like to think of it also, again, as a, as a reflection of this culture that is about, again, public space. And if anything, music is a kind of mediation of public space. So the tag, I want to think about that not just as a visual thing, but as an audio thing. You can think of it as the idea of a sample. When you hear a sound, you hear a rhythm or a drum beat or a jazz motif, that's an audio logo. And it's a kind of audio tag. So these kids, what's so beautiful about that is they use the subway as a network. They sent messages. They sent their names going through the system. They were able to transform public space and try and use it in a beautiful way that made it reflect their local environment. So if you were from one neighborhood, you'd be able to see somebody's tag kind of like an encrypted message and be able to read it um, and be able to unpack the meaning out of that. So if you weren't from that area and you didn't know that style, it would be very hard to read. In fact, you'd be illiterate in that style. So these are kinds of different literacy. Now, translate that to sound. What happens when you realize the internet has collapsed all the kinds of geographies we're used to? We're here in Asheville, but there's wireless networks, cell phone relays, satellite systems, uh, GPS units, all of which are linked to all sorts of other networks that make geography become almost irrelevant. You know, I was in Tokyo the other week, and when we were driving in Tokyo, it's a, always a strange experience to see the taxi drivers looking at the GPS um, unit rather than the road. You know, they, they barely pay attention to the road. Um, so that's, that's a very 21st century update, like satellite frequencies everywhere all the time. But that's a different kind of network, and people use that too to get their expression out. Wireless communication, cell phone relays. Imagine what happens when kids start tagging that. So from one network to another, what I want to do tonight is pull you guys out of this idea of urban youth culture as just breakdancing, graffiti, hip-hop, and DJing but to get you to think about it as a broad spectrum thing here. It's not just urban youth culture, it's global culture at this point. So whether you're a b-boy in Tokyo, or a techno kid in Asheville, or a raver in the middle of a rave in London, there's a connection. And that's what I think my book is about, and that's what my music's about, is looking at global digital culture. So these kids, in a certain sense, were giving a gift of expression. And um, as an update of that, what I want to do tonight is get everybody into this idea of thinking about the gift economy. What happens when people trade? So tonight, um, as a special flourish, I burned and made a whole bunch of mixes that I want to give out tonight. Um, can we pass those out? We got a whole bunch. All right. <laughs> and um, so one thing I just want to say, it's about the gifts, so don't get greedy, you know. <laughs> Uh, just take one and pass one to your neighbor. And what you hopefully everybody will realize is that they got something different. Um, each of the CDs is a different mix and a different version of a lot of different material. Um, one of them is a very special limited edition version I made of a lot of music I've worked with different Indian artists like Talvin Singh or Nitin Sani. Another is electronic music from the Middle East. Um, I got a whole bunch of people from Palestine, Israel, Egypt, Turkey, Iran, Iraq uh, to give electronic music for that mix. Um, I've remixed people's like Yoko Ono or The Doors or The Clash. Um, that's on another mix. So, oh yeah, and if you got the orange one, that's about 40 years of Jamaican music. That's a project I did with Trojan Records. Um, so you have to imagine you're in Kingston, Jamaica around 1967, you know. Um, so, with that said and done, um, as we pa pass these out, yeah, uh, they're going to be rotating through the audience and just please take one and pass it on. And just think about the idea of the gift economy, of being able to trade. And I want everybody to leave here tonight with that idea of trade, you know, the gift economy, exchange. All right. 
So tonight, what I want to do is walk you guys through some of the issues that I think about when I look at remix culture. And one of them is this very funny uh, kind of situation that I want to point out. And that's this gentleman. Uh, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But what I want to do is, is play you an example of the remix applied to uh, this gentleman. Uh, so with, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, George Bush. During these last few months, I've been trained by Al-Qaeda, and I'm weak and materialistic. I told our country and I told the world, if it feels good, do it. I hope you'll enjoy me in expressing fear and selfishness. We will embrace tyranny and death as a cause and a creed. We can be summed up in one word, evil. I am committed to defeating not only the good work of charities, but the values that will bring lasting peace. And we have a great opportunity during this time of war to lead the world towards suicide and murder. Let's roll. All right, so the remix. I think you get the idea, right? There's some memories that we all share that we just want to change a little bit, you know? Um, and I tend to think of that as a reflection of, of the 20th century's kind of main motif for me as an artist was that it was the era of mass production, mass consumerism, mass man, uh, what they call the man in the gray hat, you know, the 1950s character in a flannel suit, everyone dressing the same, and basically, you know, the company man. Um, the 21st century is the era of mass customization, where you're being able to have all this media around you, all these clothes, all these shoes, all these books, uh, the PDF files, Wikipedia, YouTube, and it's not about their version, it's about your version. And what I want to do is think about that from the level of DJ culture, because it's about the first kind of idea of analog remixing versus digital remixing, you know? Grandmaster Flash, Grand Wizard Theodore, um, you know, Carl Craig, a lot of all sorts of people from the DJ scene. But that was just one area. It's, that's the visual and the audio. I want to kind of tonight pull those two together. And what I want to do is um, just use that Bush thing as an example of something that millions of people saw, but everyone walked away with a different version. So, say for example, we have the most televised war in human history, and nobody knows what's going on, right? Um, so, in philosophy, because this is a philosophy lecture, um, <laughs> I think they would call that postmodern. Uh, so, to me, the fun part of looking at that piece is that you have to imagine the idea of a found object, whether it's a presidential speech, or a record, or a data file, it implies that there's a gift going on here where you're transforming and then giving and exchanging. So the remix is a kind of uh, inheritance of what philosophers throughout the ages like to think of as this kind of idea of consciousness because you're looking at something that relates to objects and subjectivity and pulls things from A to B and back again. So there's these kinds of loops and feedback, loops and feedback, loops and feedback, loops and feedback going on. It's not necessarily about the old school method of thinking about art as just a sculpture or just painting, uh, why not upload it, make a PDF file that's downloadable for anybody, put it as a freeware, open source. Um, so tonight, the mixes I gave out to you are open source culture. They're things that I hope everybody will trade. There's very rare material. I collect old 45s of Jamaican music. Uh, there's the Clash, the remixes, you name it. Um, but I want to update that Bush piece with a friend of mine, or an associate, by the name of Danger Mouse, and he had a... <laughs> he had a really funny uh, album where he took 
the, uh, how should I put it, the Beatles and ran it through, oops, you know what, I didn't upload it yet. I'll have to go through the files here. You guys get a little uh, spooky hard drive here. Um, and basically he took the Beatles and um, mixed them with Jay-Z. So you have the Beatles' white album versus Jay-Z's the black album. So think about that and just remix it and we call it gray. And the Beatles, of course, have some very high octane lawyers and they were able to uh, shut down the website, make sure that his music and materials were erased from the web, uh, cell phones. Keep, you, you can keep them on, right? We can just, right, we'll do a little cell phone symphony in a second. <laughs> um, I, you know, ringtones are DJing too. So basically, I just want to get you to think about what you just saw with the Bush one, and we're going to juggle that and then bring it up to rhythm. So here we go.